Hey guys, this is Chem 94509 and this is an episode of a game that I've absolutely fallen in love with called Kerbal Space Program. Um, it's an indie game uh, made by a company called Squad. Um, I'll set up a link to the game on the, on the, on the description below. Um, anyway, so I, today I'm going to just go through some basics of the game so the things I do in the future make at least some amount of sense. Uh, this here is the vehicle assembly building. It's where you build the rock. It's where you build the rockets that go up into space. This is the space plane hangar, where you build the space planes that kill all your kerbals because you're probably because you're probably not very good at building them. Okay, so but that I'm just being silly. I'm projecting. I'm actually really bad at space planes. This is the tracking station. We'll see that later. This is the launch pad. It's where you launch your rockets that go up into space, hopefully. And here is your runway where you launch your kerbals into the sea. I mean, into space, horizontally. This is inside the vehicle assembly building. Uh, these five parts, six parts here, these six, one, two, three, four, five, six, are parts that are in the vanilla game, it's the basic game, as is this part, this part, and this part. The rest of them are mod parts that I have, because I don't worry about it, I'll, I'll tell you why I have them later. One of the, one of the, one of the parts, sets of parts makes the game easy, and one of the sets of the parts makes the game hard. Don't worry about it. Anyway, um, we're just going to put the most stock, a stock one Kerbal Command pod on here, and we're going to throw a parachute on top of it. Um, where the, there's the parachute. This is the Mark 16 parachute. It's the small parachute that fits right on top of the uh, thing here. Um, and then we're going to put a, um, a... Where is it? Here it is. A dry fuel booster underneath it, and we're going to show you what happens with that. Um, you didn't see that. Uh, actually, you did. I was just making it so that the parachute wouldn't go off when I activated the booster. Don't worry about it. And we're going to call this dry fuel demonstration. Um, these things are not the boosters you'll actually see me use most of the time, but I'm just showing it off because it means that I only have to press the space bar and wait, and so you can so that I don't have to so that I you know, don't have to show off anything complicated. Basically, when you launch a rocket. Um, the first, so this here is just demonstrating sort of what, what a launch that doesn't work looks like, but it's also, I suppose I was showing off the basic game, and just, it's a rocket. Um, this is going to go about 17,000 meters up. I did a previous episode where I tested this, um, and then I'm going to, then once it, then I'm going to open the parachute, and I'm going to, that way I'm going to demonstrate, you know, sort of, what this will all look like when I launch a rocket. This guy here is Jeb. Everybody loves Jeb. There are other Kerbals, but everybody loves Jeb. Why does everybody love Jeb? Because he's always happy. Unless your rocket explodes, which case he's actually not happy. And if he explodes, of course he isn't happy, but that's beside the point. This here is... So this is a demonstration of sort of I suppose how a rocket. I don't know. I don't even know why I decided to do this, but I've decided to do this. So I'm showing off a, a dry fuel rocket that's just really basic. Um, and I suppose I'm also showing you, you know, sort of. I don't know. I don't know why I did this. This doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, I I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Uh, also, I just eighteen thousand meters. I guess. I guess wrong. Note to self: do not stick fingers in mouth to try to pick an uncomfortable area on cheek during Let's Plays. It makes voice sound funny. My retainer grazed the side of my cheek the other day, and it, um... It hurts. Um... More to the point, it's really annoying. So now I've opened the parachute. It, it, right now it's not full, fully open, so I suppose I'm, I am showing off that. Um, and it'll slow down my rocket a little bit until it reaches 500 meters. Oh, I know why I was doing this. I was going to demonstrate physical time warp, which is time warps all the way up to times four, but it doesn't go any higher when you're in the atmosphere. This rocket spends its entire life in the atmosphere. So I can speed up and slow down time. And I can maneuver my rocket's directions with AWSD. Obviously, it doesn't do anything when it's falling, because it's not under, you know, or other, it's not, when it, it's not under power, which, you know, it's not. I suppose it does if you have wings and stuff, but it, this doesn't have wings, so it, it's kind of not a plane. That's a parachute, which actually drags it upright. What's really funny to watch is watch the uh, SAS and, uh, and 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 gravity arguing. I expect I have no ASAS, so there's no argument. Fair enough. Um, 
uh, as, <laughs> ASAS is another thing entirely, and I'll show that off in a while. It essentially makes sure that my rocket is always going straight up, which is important. Because some rockets, just if they're not, if they, if they don't have anything, essentially an autopilot or worse, me trying to pilot to keep them going up, they will wind up pointing down. And when your rocket points down, you are not going to space today. You will notice the parachute is now fully open. I don't know when that happened, but it happens 500 meters off the ground, wherever the ground is, on Kerbin, which is the name of the planet. Um, on other things, like um, like I think Eve, it opens like a thousand or something, and like on the other planet, it opens earlier, it opens later instead of earlier. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know. I, I've never, I don't actually know that much about how parachutes really work. I just know that on Kerbin, they open 500 meters above the ground, and they're enough to slow down this this contraption. One should be enough to slow down this contraption. Hopefully, I think, I'm not entirely sure. Um, we turning on physical time warp because this is really boring to watch. Yay, we're at the, we're at the ground. And actually, the physical, bo the dry booster blew up. But the, pro the, but the pod here did not, so everybody survived. You'll notice that Jebediah is in fact freaking out when the dry fuel booster breaks. That's proof to everybody that yes, that actually is how it works. He also decided he's never going to stop freaking out. This button here takes the Kerbal out. And then I can have him let go and do stupid things on the surface, like... I don't know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do on the surface here, honestly. What I do know is that I'm going to go on to showing off more complicated contraptions, so... Uh, now I'm going to hopefully try to get into orbit. We. I don't need that. I do need that. I need... My SAS, there it is. This is an advanced SAS module. It acts as an autopilot. Not really an autopilot, it just keeps me pointing the direction I say to point. This is a decoupler. Decouplers allow for staging. Um, the reason there's a decoupler here is so that this happens. Yeah, anyway. Um, the reason there's a decoupler here is so that it can break off from the rest of the rocket so we don't wind up with the rocket blow it blowing up when it comes down. This is a liquid fuel tank, because we're going to use liquid engines, not solid engines, but those are a little more complicated to explain because they have throttle and stuff. But the shift and control keys to change the throttle, and I'll show you where that, where you'll see the indication of that changing, aside from the amount of stuff coming out of the rocket, uh, when we actually get into the game. This is a nuclear engine. Um, it's a liquid engine that has a relatively high um, ISP and vacuum, which just indicates its fuel efficiency. We're gonna add. We're gonna decoupler. We're gonna add. We're gonna add. Where's the decoupler? Uh, there are decouplers, right? Sorry, I'm having trouble finding things right now because it's hard to talk and play at the same time. I think this should. So this this alone will not go to space, but well, we already have two stages, so I might as well go for a third stage. Just to be my. Hmm. I don't know. Kind of an ugly design. I'm sure there's a better solution somewhere in my. I'm sure I have an idea for a better solution. These are much bigger rockets. So this here is a. Um, for this is an LV45, which has a marginally lower power and marginally higher weight than the LV. Does that have a higher weight? I don't remember. Yeah, marginally higher weight not mass uh, than the um, LV30. The LV-45 does. The LV-45, however, has thrust vectoring, which just is good. It means that your engine helps keep your rocket going straight up. This here is the mainsail engine. It's moderately less fuel efficient, but it's really powerful. Theoretically, I could use a weird cube strut trick to make it... Anyway, it's really complicated. I could have lots of LV-45s or LV-30s on the bottom of this, but I'm not going to because that's just... that's kind of silly looking and... Yeah. <laughs> Oh, remote tech. Um, here we go. Here is our launch vehicle. Uh, is this going to work? I don't know if this is going to go to space, but let's see. So, the... Um, do, 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 do. There we go. The throttle control is here. It's down here. Waiting for the game to load. Sorry. There, yeah. Throttle control, the, the indication of where my throttle is, is down here. That's it at 100, that's it at 0. Uh, here you'll see the indicator that tells you whether or not my SAS is on. Here is my artificial horizon. I will point it in the direction I want to go. Um, here is the RCS thing. I don't have RCS on this craft because I'm not going to use it for anything that really requires RCS. So, no RCS on this thing. 
Here is my staging indicator, although you'll see stage changes on uh, here. Here is Bill Kerman. He's a little he's a little more of a scaredy cat than Jebediah is. So we're going to throttle all the way up, take off. Once we get about there, we're going to throttle down to like there. I think it's like there that Mac Jeb always throttles to, but I may be a little high. I'm a little high on my throttle, I think, but I don't remember exactly where I should throttle to. We're going to try to perform a reasonable gravity turn today. Um, I'm probably going to botch it because I always do weird. I have the, I, I learned to gravity turn weird because I learned without you know having any assistance. So I like gravity turn at thirty six thousand when I don't pay attention. Um, most people do their gravity turn at ten thousand meters. A gravity turn is where you start turning to the side because. If you don't turn your rocket, you just keep going straight up. You'll wind, you won't wind up in orbit of the planet you're launching from. You'll wind up in the orbit of the sun, which is great if you want to be in orbit of the sun. Although I think it's marginally more efficient to burn from or I don't remember. Um, it, it can be marginally more efficient to burn from orbit sometimes. I don't remember. Either way, um, if you're burning from orbit, you know, if, if you're going straight up, you won't wind up in orbit of the planet you want to be in orbit of, unless you like go past anyway. That's complicated, and I'm not going to talk about it, because fundamentally, you have to turn if you want to wind up in orbit. And we're, we're trying to get up and stay up. So we make a migrant marginal turn towards this, turn towards the direction I'm currently turning, by the way. You don't want to turn the other direction, because otherwise you'll lose more energy. Oh, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. Are we spin? Are we done spinning yet? Are we done spinning yet? Yes, we're done spinning. Good. You have to stop spinning. <laughs> you sometimes have to turn off and turn back on SAS if you want to stop spinning. I'm going to turn a little more. So the reason you turn this way is because that's the direction you you have you have some amount of velocity going that way to begin with, just be, just staying on the surface. And so we're going. So when we launch, we want to burn that way because it saves us not only the energy, it saves us the amount of energy we go by, it saves us the amount of energy we have going that way. Um, obviously, we could burn, uh, we could burn any direction we wanted to. We could go the opposite direction. If we went the opposite direction, we would have to pay twice. We have to use. We would wind up using twice as much energy, uh, twice as much as the amount of energy that we have already, because we would have to both first cancel it and then turn anyway, then turn it around. So, and actually, get the energy we needed. So, this is my map screen. This is my highest point in my orbit, called my apoapsis. It is currently eighty-six thousand meters. This here is my rocket. Um, I don't know, I don't know. Here's the indicator of my rocket. Here's a piece of uh, debris. Here is my landing from earlier. And we're going to cut the throttle here. Um, I'm good at this game. And we're going to turn the craft. You'll notice I don't turn as well when my craft is... Uh, sorry, turning on SAS because I screwed up. Um, is... Uh, is not under power. That's because this engine has thrust vectoring. Although, from what I'm understanding, even the, for weirdly enough, even the nuclear engine, which doesn't, as far as I know, have thrust vectoring, um, does appear to add more ability to torque to, to turn your ship when you're under power. It doesn't make any sense to me because, it, as I said, doesn't have it, then thrust vectoring. But there could be some reason that that's what more happens. Either way, what I do know. So that's about the angle I want to be at. I actually want to be a couple degrees further this way, but it doesn't matter that much. I'm not trying to put myself in a particular orbit. I don't care if my orbit's a little messy, because I'm just showing off how to get into orbit. And if I were trying to get into a particular orbit, I wouldn't put my orbit so low. Some people like to do their dock and get, you know, 100k, but that's not how I'm going to do it. And what? And next time, of course, we're going to be like, now we're going to do something really hard compared to what we just did. Because I'm going to start building a space station. So now that we're done with now that we're done with the really easy stuff, let's demonstrate what it's like to do the hard stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there we go. It's like SAS, please turn off. Please don't be a jerk. There we go. Um, that's about the angle we want to be at. We're gonna burn about thirty seconds before the apoapsis. Uh, three, two, one, burn. So I'm just going to keep burning this engine until it runs out of fuel. Oh, right, I'm going to run out of fuel, and then I'm going to have to go over to this engine right. Uh, this might not be an orbit. We'll see. <laughs> we, might not be, we might not be staying in space today. We are, however, definitely in space. I'm in space. And as always, Cam 9509 has the worst voice, is the worst voiced actor in existence. 
That probe core totally sounds like that, right? Right, right. You totally agree, right? No, you don't, because I'm awful at that. Anyway, so uh, how long do I have? Like two minutes, OK. Um, I'm actually going to burn upwards just a little, because I think that adds more time. To I don't know. I don't know if this is a good idea, guys. I, I'm, just, I'm just screwing around at this point. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing at all. Am I going up? Am I no longer going as far down at least? And why am I off? I'm really bad at this. I need to get up to 2,500 meters a second, roughly, and I'm at about 1,500. Um, this is a really efficient engine. What I forgot to mention earlier is that it's not a very powerful engine. All my other engines were like 220 knots of thrust. This produces like 60. That's kill it. That, that can't be knots. I don't know what that is. Knots. Yeah, let's use the random terms that I know about something. No, um, that's... Might be knots, I don't know. Newtons, maybe. Kilonewtons, maybe? I have no clue. I'm just I'm just making shit up at this point. I don't know what it actually is. Well, not completely. Anyway, this produces 60 units, whatever the unit of thrust is, which I don't actually know what it is. Um, the big engine, the first big engine I had produces, if you if you think about it, 1,500 of those. Um, and the LV45s that I was using produced 200. So this produces about a third as much thrust, but it's like four times more efficient per unit of fuel. That is to say that it burns about 16 times as long in total. Um, it's actually close to only twice as efficient. It's only really burns about eight times as long, but it's, you know, or rather six times as long, but it's, you know, but it produces only like twice as much thrust in total. But it's really good, you know, to some extent that that, that, that amount is still huge. Yay, we're now, we now have a periapsis. The periapsis is the lowest point in your flight. Once it's above 70, or actually 60 point something K, congratulations, you have an orbit. Your orbit will stay roughly the way it currently is. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna warp. So you also wanna adjust one of the, your front, if you wanna adjust your periapsis, you do it at your apoapsis. If you wanna adjust your apoapsis, you do it at your periapsis. I'm trying to raise my periapsis to about the level my apoapsis is currently at. So I'm going to time accelerate at 50 times because I'm no longer in the atmosphere. So I can time accelerate way faster if I'm not like under thrust or something. Because the game doesn't do the physics warp stuff. Until I reach my apoapsis, where I will slow down, turn towards my prograde vector. My prograde vector on my nav ball, this thing here, which the little green thing in my my mouse and also my little orange cursor thingy is now over. I will wait until roughly a apoapsis, and then I will burn prograde. Burning prograde is what I'm currently doing. And now I'm going to say, well, how close are those? Are those close enough? Eh, they're close enough for re any reasonable work, but I'm trying to show off, so I'm going to make, I'm going to line up the best I can. Tell me like one minute away. Okay. So obviously I'm going to wait till my apoapsis comes back, that way I get more, uh, just, you know, the closer you are to apoapsis, the more you affect your, the more you affect your periapsis compared to your apoapsis, plus, you know, I'm actually, yeah, anyway, your apoapsis moves when you move your periap, when you, when you start burning fuel and they're close together. Anyway, I'm not going to try to explain right now, because I'm doing relatively difficult stuff here. I don't want these to be within, say, a thousand of one another. And I'm gonna wait till this is about two minutes away, and then I'm gonna time warp forward to reach it. Okay. And we're actually really close to being where I wanted it to be. Uh, apparently, my thing under time warp was just being wrong, so that's bad. Or, I, good, I did not hit the space bar. So, or I could have hit the space bar, and my Kerbal could now be trapped in space. And now we're just going to wait until they get... And now they're within like 200 of one another. So we are now in a stable, relatively circular orbit. Um, but now you say, Cam, you now have a Kerbal, you, you now have this Kerbal in space. How are you going to get back home? Well, luckily, I have a lot of fuel left. <laughs> All those are indicators of the exact same thing right now. So, whatever.
So we're going to wait till our app, till our app lapses, because I think that should be the most efficient point to burn retrograde at. And we're going to show you how you deorbit. See this prograde vector here? Well, there's a vector on the exact opposite point of... Oh, yeah, it's just being glitchy. Um, so there's a point on the exact opposite point of the nav ball, of the artificial horizon, as it's called, called the retrograde vector. It looks a lot like the prograde vector, but you'll notice it has these little three things on it, and there's, a pure, there's like an X to the middle of it or something. That there is the retrograde vector. We're going to burn retrograde. Burning retrograde means slowing down, means more burning the direction opposite the direction we are currently going. We're going to slow down. Now, since I feel like showing off atmos showing off the fact the atmosphere does do something, I'll burn to say 15,000 meters. That's above the surface of carbon. But it's still close enough the atmosphere will catch us and pull us down. Then I'm going to separate and see how far down I got. Okay, that actually puts me at 12,000 meters. Open my par or rather tell my parachute that I want it to open once we're in the atmosphere. And watch as the dry fuel debris. Hopefully they're still in, yeah, hopefully they're still on a return trajectory. They're not. They're going to fly around the planet because objects that aren't currently loaded don't have drag effects. That's right. Wonderful. Okay, so that thing there is going to be in space until I decide that it's not in space anymore. I'm going to, I'm effectively going to do something later to clean that up because it shouldn't remain in space even though it will remain in space because, yeah, objects that aren't loaded don't have the dra don't, don't do drag simulation. Oh, we appear to be in the atmosphere. I am now below the point where the atmosphere starts. So let's look at where our periapsis is. You'll notice what's falling, and our apoapsis is falling about the same speed, actually, because eh, it's falling a little faster, but not much faster. And we're going to turn up physical time warp. And we're going to see where we are. We're at like 62,000 meters. We're going really fast. Um, 55,000. Okay, 55,000, and you'll notice this is like only 11k now, and this is like, doesn't matter because we're never going to reach there again. Um, this may say it's at 10k, but it's not actually going to happen because the atmosphere is slowing us down. We're at 7k now, and now we're at like 5k, and now we know that we're going to land. Cool. We're going to wait until we reach the point at which the drag chute opens and we're going to slow down. The parachute opens in two parts, as you remember, so we're going to wait until we open the parachute, and then we're going to slow down the time warp. We actually want to slow down the time warp beforehand, because I don't know if... I don't know if it's typical for it to glitch out. You'll notice that we are slowing down at this point. Um, even though we're falling, we're, we're, we're well past our terminal velocity. Actually, I don't know if that's really true if we're technically... Yes, we're, I think that actually does mean we're past our terminal velocity. Although it's more complicated. Wonderful. There's a fire alarm going off, but it's not really a fire alarm. You're going to hear some be annoying beeping. That's actually the test function, which for some reason it's decided that our remote, the remote for the TV is its, um, is its remote. And so whenever we turn on and off the TV, it will occasionally randomly decide that it's going to make really loud and obnoxious noises. Um, anyway, so now that we're done, now that I'm done talking about the background noise you may or may not hear that's really frustrating... I'll go back to talk about my rocket. My rocket should land. We should open the drag. Should open it somewhat time. I actually don't know. There we go. Twenty three k or so. You'll notice that my parachute is slowing me down again. Bill Kerman is freaking out. But nothing blew up. But I'm not Jeb. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to stop arguing with the thing on the computer. That doesn't make any sense. And I'm going to wait impatiently for my um, parachute to slow down my kerbal. Now going 18, 17, 16,000, 15,000 meters, we're up 14, 12, but we're also at like 800 meters per second, which is way slower than we entered the atmosphere, which was like 22k, we peaked at like 24k. You'll notice that we're currently experiencing like 1g, because there's a g-force gauge over here, g's don't actually do anything to your kerbals, because it's not simulate, I, I don't know, kerbals are apparently frickin' immortal. Um, they also don't die of old age. You could simulate the game for like a thousand years and they'll have the same Kerbal. Uh, they are really hard to kill. They can be killed uh, if you put them at an exceedingly high speed and then stop them suddenly when they're in their EVA suits. Or if you break the capsule they're in. Um, capsule, uh, the command pod they're in. Uh, we're very slowly slowing down. Um, we're at 10k meters and we're at like 200 meters per second. 
you'll notice that we not only do we not have a periapsis, our apoapsis is like being weird. Our apoapsis is behind us, even though we're not anyway going up. It, it's yeah. Taking less the trajectory we are theoretically on, if we were actually really, if it was really working like that. So you'll notice we've slowed down a lot. Well, also, you'll also probably notice that our parachutes open much higher than they did when we were at um, the Kerbal Space Center, because the Kerbal Space Center that we were at, way over wherever, I obviously can't see it because I'm like on, I'm on some other random part of the planet, was way closer to sea level, and it opens 500 meters above the ground at 500 meters of true alt, a true altitude above the ground instead of 500 meters of altitude above sea level. I also appear to be visually clipping with the ground. Uh, no, it's just my camera moving stupidly. Okay. You will see that we're at 115, not 1312 meters per second down here, so we're, you know, we're at a reasonable descent speed. Uh, low enough speed, hopefully, that when the parachute opens, it won't rip off the capsule and proceed to drop the capsule falling to Earth, killing poor Bill Kerman in the process. And by Earth, I mean Kerman, since the planet's name is Kerman. Aha! There you see that. Caps, the uh, parachute is open. We are now going 6.9 meters per second. Slow enough that no one will die when we touch the ground. And that is how I won this episode. Um, I'll do another episode of Curl Space Program on the smaller day. But for now, I just wanted to show off some of the basics so that when I do some like, more complicated stuff, it's not like What's going on, Cam? What are you doing? I don't understand. You all have some basic understanding of the game. And where is the ground anyway? Um <laughs> The rest of y'all can go back in time and check where the ground should be based on my previous statements, but I can't because I can't go back in time. I could probably pause the game, pause my stop my recording save my video, wait for all 27 minutes of 1080p footage to render, um, maybe it's 720p, I actually think it's 720p, yeah, my 720p footage to render, um, then watch it, figure out where the point is, and then obviously see what the number is, and then I would know roughly where my um, landing point will be, but I think it's just 300 or something, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't need to do that, and I don't do that anyway, because really, why would I do that? It's going to touch down where it touches down, and there's not much I can do at this point. In fact, I don't think there's anything I can do with it. Well, I mean, maybe I could Eva Bill Kerman and, like, have him use his jetpack to descend slowly or something stupid like that. It doesn't matter. And now we're on the ground. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time with something less instructive and more fun.